Welcome to Being a Successful Leader with Carl Welty. Carl is a leadership pioneer with years of challenging leadership and consulting experience. Here's Carl with some valuable insights, practical and proven methods for being a successful leader. Greetings, everyone. Carl Welty here, your host for the uh, ongoing podcast series, Being a Successful Leader. A podcast uh, every episode every week lasts from uh, 15 minutes to a half hour. So the intent of the series is to provide you, uh, the leader, with uh, valuable insights and practical and proven uh, know-how. It's always been a passion of mine in my professional career and looking back, you know, effective leadership and organization effectiveness. And I've been blessed with being able to feed that passion through my experiences in leadership and then coaching and training and, and consulting and picked up a lot of good stuff along the way in terms of uh, not only the concepts, but uh, how to do it. And so that's what this uh, podcast is all about, passing it on to you and hopefully it'll be of help to you. And I also have uh, three books, and the three books are foundations for what I uh, call my three uh, leadership imperatives. And the series revolves around those three leadership imperatives. And they are, number one, uh, leadership begins with you, uh, you as a uh, self-aware and uh, skillful leader. And then you move out and you uh, 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 forge a direction. And so the second book is Making and Fulfilling Your Dreams as a Leader. And it's all about formulating and executing a uh, sound strategy. And the last, you need people to rally around, rally around that sound strategy. So the last of the three imperatives is uh, building commitments, how to go about building a culture of commitments. So those are the three, and all the topics revolve around uh, those. Now, in addition to my three books, but you can look at the books on, uh, if you haven't gotten them already, on uh, Wealthy.com, my website, and go over to uh, Leadership Resources and then click on Books, and you'll see the three books there and how to order them, Barnes & Noble, uh, Amazon, or the uh, publisher, Ewing's Publishing. Um, and uh, I like what we're doing here because we talk about these, I think, valuable subjects, and then you have ongoing resource with the books, and you can go back to the uh, past podcasts. This is the 49th podcast. And just by going to web talk, webtalkradio.net, webtalkradio.net, and then click on channels, scroll down to uh, leadership in the workplace, and then scroll down to my uh, uh, icon there, uh, successful, being a successful leader, and you'll see all the past uh, podcasts there. So it makes for a nice uh, package, and I hope that you take advantage of that and find it very, very worthwhile. Okay. Our topic today is planning and managing your larger projects, planning and managing your larger projects. Now, we have talked uh, one of the podcasts, and it's it's uh, in in my uh, book, uh, Building Commitment, uh, on the uh, – no, it's, it's actually, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Making and Fulfilling Your Dreams as a Leader, uh, the uh, the strategy book. And we have a whole chapter there on action planning, project planning. And what I want to do today uh, is to is to build on that a little bit. Uh, you can use that foundation, very solid foundation on on action planning, project planning, and then add a few little uh, concepts and and pieces to it that are picked up along the way that'll help you in your larger kinds of projects. All right. So that's our objective here today. So I want to start off with the project charter, I call it project charter. This is where you're beginning to assemble a, 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 a get your ideas together and then assemble a team for a larger kind of project. And what I do here, recommend here is to just build on the project specification steps. Remember this, the steps we had in action planning was the project specifications and then to reach out and look at the implementation opportunities and challenges. And then we had the work breakdown structure and then the work plan. Uh, those were the steps. So the project specifications is an important step. That's where you, uh, do some quality thinking and interacting about just what do we, what, what do we have here? What's the challenge or the opportunity? What, what's our objective? What does success look like? Uh, accountabilities and those sorts of things. And so we can use that same structure and add on to it just a little bit, uh, and, and call it a project charter. So let me speak to that. Again, the, uh, Project specifications are, in this case, project charter. You start off the same as the specifications. What's the business opportunity or challenge? Just a summary of uh, what. why are we excited about uh, attacking this? 
Uh, number two is what's the particular objective in a one sentence summary of this particular project? What are the desired outcomes? How do we know success when we see it? What are the evidences that will say to us, hey, I think we're hitting bullseye here? Uh, what's the value? Uh, summarize the value of if we're successful with this project, what, what can we uh, really gain out of it? And this, this one here, overall roles and responsibilities is the one I augment for uh, a major project. And what I'm recommending is that you, you identify the project sponsor. It could be if several officers or one officer and then designate uh, who's going to take the lead on this. And the importance of that is because then you'll have a project manager. And uh, again, this is uh, your bigger project, and it, we may run into uh, uh, gaps and valleys and you know barriers and things like that. So somebody to turn to for the project or the project manager when uh, they need help, the project needs help to, to move along, bust some barriers and get, get moving again. So the project's uh, manager turns to the spot project sponsor. And again, on a large project, maybe the project sponsor can skirt across the organization, go horizontally in the organization and, and um, resolve conflict differences with other officers or, or, or people of that nature. So you have your project sponsor and what's the role of project sponsor and then the project manager. That's all under overall roles and uh, accountabilities. And then you have your timing. That's the uh, uh, the uh, predicted uh, beginning and ending of your project. So that's the project charter with the addition of the project sponsor and the uh, project manager. It uh, I, I switched the title to project charter. Nice place to start. Uh, and then you, you could actually uh, write it up, uh, like, like taking the project specification, project charter, and, and write it up as the project charter. And behind it, you don't need to publicize that, but you're the project, uh, the rest of the project plan. The project charter can stand on its own. It could be sent out as a letter to other officers, you know, with the signature of the project sponsor and maybe the other officers or and the project manager to, to alert people about this big time project. Okay. Let's talk about the team now. You have a project tar charter. Let's talk about the team, the, the various combinations of uh, forming a team. One would be just a normal work group. You know, it's a big time deal, but it's a normal work group that's going to carry this project out. Another possibility is the normal work group, but you augment it with some talents you need, some expertise from other organizations, uh, uh, or organizational departments that you bring on to the team. A third uh, uh, possibility is what, you know, probably called a cross-functional team. You borrow from different organizations and appoint a project's uh, manager, and that's what's called a project uh, uh, cross-functional team. Or you could have a, a dedicated project team that uh, they, uh, they are, it's going to be a long-term project and they may co-locate. Co and uh, it could be that uh, people leave their home department and join the project for uh, quite a while. And then after that, they'll go back into maybe their traditional functional unit or wherever, but it's a long-term project. So you have normal work group, you have cross-functional groups, you have normal work group augmented, and you have a dedicated project team. Um, a cross-functional group could be part-time or full-time membership of the people joining. Uh, but if it's full-time membership, I want to spend a minute here and talk about something very, very important. Again, it's on the front end. Uh, you know, you've got your project charter, but uh, along about that time, you'd want to get the key uh, leaders involved here. So up front, we agree on on the uh, relationships and the uh, responsibilities to the uh, uh, people coming over to the project. So uh, bear with me here. Maybe uh, just draw uh, on a piece of paper there. Four little circles, I guess, are fine enough. On the top, put GM. Let's say that's general manager. Uh, that may, may not be the title. It could be executive vice president. Could be vice president. Could be president. But up on top is the, the the head shed. And then off to the left, let's call that functional leader. Draw a circle or a diamond, whatever you care to. And off to the right, uh, moving down the paper, will be project manager. So you have general manager on the top, and then down a ways to the left, functional manager, functional leader. Off to the right, project manager. And then down below those two, the project manager and functional leader, uh, draw another diamond, uh, assigned team member, assigned team member. 
So that's a nice little diagram. And then what you want to do up front is get agreement uh, between the functional leader and the uh, project uh, manager. The GM may play a role in this as to what their uh, responsibilities are in terms of that assigned team member. Okay. So the typical is that the functional leader still would be in charge of that uh, full-time assigned team members development. There may be some key learning, some seminars, uh, some special sessions back in the home base that the, uh, that they need that person for. And uh, they, uh, there could be times where the, uh, they call the person back temporarily to work on, on something. So that's the functional lead of the development and maybe special uh, requests or special assignments. Then the project manager, of course, uh, the project manager should be in charge of day-to-day direction to the assigned full-time team member. And um, when it comes time for uh, reviewing how's it going, either formally through an organization performance planning review or just chatting, uh, they should both get involved there, the uh, functional leader and the project manager in terms of uh, how how's performance going, the planning and review, and, ha- and be talking to that assigned team member. And uh, that's, that's an important piece there. Okay, uh, so now we have the project charter and then uh, consideration for the team when you have uh, uh, full-time uh, uh, functional people coming in from the sides to join the project. The next uh, piece here would be team agreements. We've talked about that before. It's in in the books that I have. Um, but uh, the team, the project team, may or may not uh, uh, be involved, or the uh, project planning group may not be involved in the team agreements. But sooner or later, the team, when once it assembles and inherits the project charter, uh, whether they've been a part of that or not, team agreements I think are really important. And, and these are the, the commitments that the, that the leader and the team make to one another and how they're going to work together during this project and uh, the accountability for doing so. It's kind of like uh, core values, of course, as we talked a lot about, and it's, it's part of the uh, making and fulfilling your dreams as a leader under identity, part of uh, identity, purpose, and core values. But whereas core values are, are organization-wide, or at least organizational entity-wide, uh, and they're, uh, as I've defined them, essential enduring beliefs based on key business ideas, very important key business ideas, uh, to guide everyday thinking and behavior. These are not namby-pamby, idealistic, you know, vanilla-like kinds of things. We love our customers, and we treat each other really good, and all that stuff. Forget it. Business ideas, a critical few, maybe two, three, four. Although that's core values, but for the team, this is the commitments they make to one another and how they're going to behave uh, as they during the course of the project and hold each other accountable. So there's two parts to this structure, uh, and, and team agreements should be critical uh, or critical and, and a few too, just like core values. You don't want a big laundry list and then you have three, four, five, that sort of thing. And you say so you have the agreement, usually one sentence, and then you have the accountability. How are we going to hold each other uh, accountable for achieving this uh, agreement? Or when we go off track, how are we going to bring each other back on track? Let me give an example of a, of a uh, team agreement. Um, the uh, agreement would be to express divergent points of view in an open and honest manner. This is a team agreement. And they decided that it's very important when they huddle and even in the hallways or whatever, that they're open and honest with one another, and in doing so, that they 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 invite uh, divergent uh, uh, points of view, uh, and the accountability would speak up when you feel that you are not being heard or being invalidated. Uh, so that's a good example of a of a team agreement. You can see why that would be important up front for the team uh, to uh, get those out on the table and uh, agree to it and then hold each other accountable during the course of the project. Okay, so you have your project charter, and then uh, the importance of, uh, of course, uh, assembling the team. If there's a uh, uh, full-time person, a functional assignment coming over, and then the team agreements, 
And then the next in the, in my steps uh, it would be the implementation opportunities and challenges. This is kind of unique to my methodology here, but I find it valuable. We can take advantage of some of the facilitation tools that uh, we've talked about. And uh, there again in my book uh, on uh, building commitment in the t- in the uh, uh, growing teams chapter, there's a, a section in the back team tools. And out of that, uh, you ha- I have... Uh, selected three team tools for you to, at this juncture, you got your project charter, you got your team, and maybe with your team or maybe before you assemble your team, you look ahead and say, now what's down the pike here? Before we actually tack down step one, step two, phase one, phase two, what are some of the things we uh, need to consider? So that one of the three tools is, uh, again, it's in, in the book we talked about, stakeholder analysis. Who are the key players that will make or break this project for us, the success of this project, and what are their relative uh, power and both position power, their place on the organization chart, and their personal power, their personal influence on this particular project. And um, in the book, uh, I lay out a a, a little diagram that you can use. A vertical line would be power, and, and the horizontal line at the bottom of the vertical line could be uh, the uh, uh, influence, and you could have on the left-hand side, I call it uh, alligators, and on the right-hand side, allies. <laughs> and you can use a scale of 1 to 10 and just and just look at these key influencers on the project and then place them somewhere on that map uh, from 1 to 10 in terms of power, 1 to uh, minus 10 and, and plus 10 from the zero in the center uh, for their uh, relative uh, uh uh, influence or their their support. So your yeah, support and the power. Uh, support is um, um, zero to minus ten on the left side, plus one and, or zero to plus ten on the right side. And just chart it out. Nothing scientific about it. And then have a plan. Who are you going to talk to ahead of time here? Well, out of this chart here. But don't forget the uh, the uh, the allies. They, they you know you don't take them for granted. Make sure you spend time with them too. Okay. But uh, the alligators, you especially if they have a lot of power, you want to go out and, and sit down and chat. And you may find some interesting things about uh, maybe just imagine that they're alligators. Uh, maybe they really are supportive of this uh, project that you're going to embark upon. And just by going to them and talking with them, I think you can maybe diminish any uh, resistance that they may have and maybe uh, uh, get their support. Uh, and then also... As you, your project unfolds, you want to keep in contact with these people, regardless of where they uh, uh, lie on your political action map. Okay, so that's a very important feature: the uh, stakeholder analysis. So be sure you, in any major project, give that some serious thought. Force field analysis, the second of the three tools I have here. We've talked about that; it's in the book. Uh, so there again, you draw a line down the center. And on the left-hand side, you uh, these are the drivers of your project. And those are easy to uh, identify. I mean, you're excited about it. You, you've got this missionary zeal going. And and uh, what I suggest is that you use uh, uh, arrows left to right. And the center line is status quo, okay? We'll finish this in a second. But in the, so you have resist, uh, drivers on the left-hand side, resistors on the right-hand side of your status quo line. And then you uh, identify the drivers, label them, and then uh, maybe use a scale of one to five, five being a, a long arrow and uh, two being a short arrow towards the moving it forward. But the interesting thing about going to the other side of the status quo line is taking a look at the resistance factors here. Um, many times that's not done. And of course, when you t- do your stakeholder analysis, you know, you'll be able to uh, better define these. Uh, but again, on a scale of one to five, what are some of the major barriers that you and your team face here? Uh, just by identifying, then you can begin to think of strategies to reduce, if you will, uh, these uh, barriers. Um, and you have to remember when people are involved here, when you went again out to your stakeholders, uh, and they may have a little resistance, they may not have the same missionary zeal that you have about this project. Plus, they don't know as much about it. You know, they haven't been privy to all the uh, 
uh, success that this may bring to the organization. So just bear that in mind. Uh, and again, with your when you do your stakeholder analysis, a lot of what your mission is going to be is going to be to educate, to educate the key stakeholders, both the alligators and the uh, the uh, allies on your project. But anyway, the force field analysis is a nice little way because many times we think of all the, the drivers, but we get to go on the other side. We're on the offense, but how about the defense here? Let's analyze the defense here. They're using a football kind of analogy, if you will, or hockey, whatever. Uh, the defense here, what can we do here to uh, um, make our offense even more powerful to penetrate this defense here and lessen the defense? Force field analysis is a great tool for that. And the last one I have of the three is risk management. Uh, this is uh, what This is simple to think about. And maybe not as easy to uh, execute, but what, what, what are the things that could go wrong here? And what can we do ahead of time to take preventive action for uh, obviating these things from going wrong? What can we do now and maybe bed that into our project plan on how to eliminate or, or obviate these uh, particular uh, problems from occurring? Or are the other as to what we do operationally, if they do occur, contingent action. You have preventive and you contingent action. What can we do if they do occur? And I recommend there, if, if something comes up that you anticipate, hope it doesn't come up, but oop, here it is. Uh, maybe you have a point person that immediately can, you can spring into action and you have a, a, a game plan that you uh, uh, orchestrate ahead of time. So those are the three tools, stakeholder analysis, force field analysis, risk management, and I, I put those under the heading of implementation opportunities and challenges. Really recommend you, 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 you use those three tools and other things you can think of to look down the pike before you start your venture here, okay? Now let's uh, uh, look at the uh, actual uh, uh, planning of the work. Uh, these these things here are, are that we talked about, the project charter, the uh, team agreements, and the implementation opportunities and challenges are really solid quality thinking and interacting part of the leadership team here. You and your project team, you and the project sponsor, perhaps, if you're the project manager. But now it's time to roll up your sleeves and actually uh, uh, plan the work. And, and, and the problem that many uh, organizations and project teams have is they go right to the work. They they pull out the, the um, Microsoft planning project or start to go phase one, phase two, and, you know, it's action oriented. Here we go. And can't, can't wait to get started, but really you need to do the quality thinking and interacting on those preliminary steps, very important preliminary leadership and management steps we just talked about. Okay. So you've done that now into the, uh, uh, the work planning. I divide this as, as you may be where we talked about it and it's in the, in the book, uh, in uh, making and fulfilling your dreams as a leader, I divide into work breakdown structure and then the work plan. Uh, and I've made mention before that the work planning process is scalable. Sometimes uh, it's pretty obvious what we need to do. Uh, and sometimes even as simple as a commitment to one another on the leadership team, we're just going to look up for these opportunities and do it. Not a big need for an exhaustive work plan. Other times, like on these projects, we're talking about the larger projects. Yeah, you're probably going to need a lot of detail here. And I recommend that you uh, start with the work breakdown structure, which is a, a, a common uh, project planning tool, okay? And what that's all about, and usually I find that three, three levels of work breakdown is enough. You have your objective, your project objective, and then you – Divide uh, it into the uh, logical work packages, the bundles of work that you, you and your project team are going to have to do, uh, or the project, if you're a project sponsor, project team that you're uh, trying to uh, help, uh, the, the logical work packages. And then underneath those work packages, identify the tasks that under the work package. So those, that's a, that's a, a nice, uh, outline, if you will, to get started. And again, being scalable for the smaller projects uh, that can't be done just top of the head or back of an envelope, uh, That's you may just stop at the work breakdown structure. It's kind of a checklist, if you will. 
And you may not need any more detail than that. But for, again, what we're talking about here, the larger projects, you'd want to touch bases with the work breakdown structure, do that outline, and then move on to a more detailed, uh, using the work breakdown structure, project plan, if you will. So those are the three levels of a work breakdown structure, the objective, the project objective, the logical work packages, and then underneath that, the task for each of the projects. And then for the larger projects, you're going to go to a work plan. And there you uh, you uh, really uh, uh, detail the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the work breakdown structure. And I have a, an outline for you again in the book, but we'll go through it here again uh, in terms of the work plan. This is the methodology for sequencing and detailing the specific work you and your gang are going to do uh, with your related accountabilities. And it involves the uh, the uh, accountabilities uh, for uh, the, the steps. You're going to have specific work. The steps could be phases for a bigger project and then steps under a phase. And then for each of the steps, you're going to have an accountability. Uh, this will be uh, the, usually the initials of the, or the name of the person that's in charge of that particular step. And then you're going to have uh, uh, the timing. Uh, what's the uh, estimated uh, completion date? for this particular step, and then the resources needed. And the resources needed, I divide into four pieces. You may not need all of these, but the four pieces I have under resource allocation are people days uh, for this particular step. What's the accumulative people days we think it'll take to complete this step? The financials, out-of-pocket cost for this particular step, if any, space and equipment needs, and information. What's the data we need? So pretty complete there. So to go through it again, uh, you've got uh, the uh, program, which is the steps in accountability, sequenced. So you sequence your work packages. And then you got your schedule, the beginning and ending dates for each step. Then you got your resource allocation uh, for each step, people days, financial, space and equipment, and information. Now, again, as I mentioned in the book, there's different methodologies uh, that you may or may not be aware of or may want to investigate or not, like uh, program evaluation, review technique, critical path method. These are uh, very sophisticated kinds of things that uh, I find in most of the projects, people don't need them. But if this is a major, major thing, you're prob probably already aware of this. Or many times I find out that there's a team that they hire a team to come in and do the planning part of it work playing part of it, or uh, a, a company that has as a lifeblood projects, they'll have a dedicated uh, department that does all the planning. Uh, but most people I deal with and probably who I'm talking to now, we don't need all of that sophistication. And what I'm laying out here for you is, is usually more than enough to be successful with your project. Okay, so there we have a a uh, review of a comprehensive, practical, and proven process for you to use to plan and manage your larger projects. And again, you'll find the uh, this in the uh, Making and Fulfilling Your Dreams as a Leader outline in, in there. And then I've added some nice features for your uh, larger projects here, like the project charter and uh, uh, some of the nuances with that. So again, uh, uh, it's there for you. And uh, you may be versed on that already. If it's kind of new to you, uh, study it because it's really important. Okay. And next time, a preview, uh, we'll, we'll turn to coaching your new associate. Somebody that you uh, uh, moved into a position that you have, be a new position or, or a uh, fulfilling an, an existing position that's been vacant. You've done a good job of targeting selection. So you assured a, a good fit, which we've talked about. Uh, throughout the series and now you need to capitalize on your investment so what are some of the things we can talk about some recommendations I have as you and this new person begin your venture together okay in terms of uh, coaching your new associate so until that, that time you take care of yourself and, and we'll see you